This is Audiobook Caboodle YouTube channel. Click on the subscribe button and listen unlimited audiobooks anytime, anywhere. Private Sex Advice to Women by R.B. Armitage Lesson 4 Gestation or Pregnancy Gestation is the act of carrying young in the uterus from the time of conception to that of parturition. Conception occurs at the moment of the impregnation of the ovum. Parturition is the act of delivery or childbirth. Pregnancy is the state of being with child. The terms period of gestation and period of pregnancy, respectfully, are employed by medical authorities to designate the time during which the mother carries the young within her own body, from the moment of the impregnation of the ovum until the moment of the final delivery of the child into the outer world. The term of pregnancy in woman continues for over nine calendar months, or ten lunar months, from about 275 to 280 days, though in exceptional cases it may be terminated in seven calendar months, or, on the other hand, may continue for ten calendar months. The usual method is to figure 280 days from the first day of the last menstruation. A simple method of calculating the probable date of delivery is as follows. Count back three months, then add seven days, and you will have the date of probable delivery. Example, a woman's first day of last menstruation is March 28th. Counting back three months gives us December 28th, and adding seven days to this gives us January 4th as the probable date of delivery. There will always be a possible margin of a few days before or after the ascertained probable date, but the delivery will very closely approximate said date. Ignore the shortage of days in February in this calculation, the same being covered by the general margin allowed. Development of the Impregnated Ovum In the preceding lesson, we terminated our consideration of the impregnated ovum at the time at which, under the process of segmentation, the primitive trace had appeared. This primitive trace appears as an opaque streak or straight line formed by an aggregation of cells of a distinctive quality. This delicate trace or streak is the first indication of the form of the coming child. It is the basis, pattern, or mold in or around which the spinal column is to be formed and around which the entire young body is to be developed by the wonderful and intricate processes of dividing and reduplication and the folding and combination of cells. From one end of this trace appears the head. From the other end appears the lower end of the spine. At a later stage there appears tiny buds in the positions at which the arms and legs should be. These gradually develop, and their ends split into tiny fingers and toes, and finally are transformed into perfect little arms and legs, miniatures of those of the adult human being. The term the embryo is employed to designate the developing young creature in the earlier stages of its development, particularly before the end of the third month of its existence. After the end of the third month, the embryo is called the fetus. In the short space of 280 days, the young creature evolves and develops from a single simple cell into a complex organism, a perfect miniature human being. Nature works a wonderful miracle here, and yet so common is it that we take it as a matter of course and lose sight of the miracle. From the most simple forms are formed in the developing creature the most complex organs and parts. The heart is formed from a tiny straight line of cells, by enlargement and partition. The stomach and intestines, likewise, develop from a tiny straight line of cells, arranged as a tiny tube. The stomach is formed by dilation of one part of the tube, while the large intestine experiences a similar, though lesser, distension, and a greater growth in length, the smaller intestine being formed by growth in length and circumference. The other organs evolve from similar simple beginnings. The embryo is nourished during its early stages by means of the yolk sac or umbilical vesicle, which is outside the body of the embryo, being joined to it by means of the umbilical duct. This yolk sac, originally formed by a drawing together in the ovum, which thus separates itself into two portions or areas, is an important feature of the life of the embryo, as it nourishes and sustains it in its earlier stages. Blood vessels form in the yolk sac, and after a time its fluid is absorbed, 
and after the third month the sac gradually disappears. After the passing away of the yolk sac, the embryo is nourished and sustained by the allantois, another peculiar sac which is formed. This sac readily becomes filled with blood vessels and serves to nourish the embryo by sustenance obtained from the body of the mother through the walls of the uterus a direct communication with the blood vessels of the mother thus being secured the blood in the embryo and that in the mother come into close contact thus allowing the embryo to be nourished by the blood of the mother after a time in turn the allantois diminishes and dwindles away its offices being taken up and performed by the placenta or afterbirth the placenta or afterbirth the placenta or afterbirth is a round flat substance or organ contained within the uterus by which communication and connection is established and maintained between the fetus and the mother by means of the umbilical cord it is a flat circular mass about seven inches in diameter and weighing about sixteen ounces it is attached to the sides of the uterus of the mother during the period of gestation and is expelled from the body of the mother as the afterbirth after the birth of the child let us pause a moment and consider the several steps in nature's plan for nourishing the embryo and fetus in the first place as we have seen there is a yolk sac or umbilical vesicle filled with the fluid which nourishes the embryo this gradually disappears in time and is replaced by the allantois which by connection with the walls of the uterus is enabled to nourish the fetus from and by the blood of the mother for a short time however the embryo is nourished by both the yolk sac and the allantois then the allantois assumes the entire task and the yolk sac passes away then later the placenta replaces the allantois and the latter passes away as did its predecessor the placenta works along the same general lines as the allantois but in a far more complex way and with a much higher degree of efficiency as we shall see presently the placenta is connected with the body of the fetus by what is known as the umbilical cord the umbilicus or navel in the human being marks the place at which the umbilical cord entered the body of the fetus from which it was severed after the birth of the child the process of the umbilical cord is to contain and support the umbilical arteries and veins through which the fetus obtains nourishment from the placental substance and through which the return blood flows the rich red arterial blood is carried from the placenta to the fetus and is then distributed over the body of the fetus nourishing and building it up the dark venous blood laden with the waste products of the body of the fetus is carried back to the placenta there to be repurified and rendered again rich and nourishing the story of the circulation of the blood of the fetus is most interesting although the fetal blood is derived from that of the mother as we have said yet the maternal blood does not pass directly from the circulatory system of the mother into that of the fetus nor does the blood of the fetus return directly into the circulatory system of the mother in fact the fetal blood never comes in direct contact with that of the mother or vice versa the fetus has an independent circulatory system of its own and yet at the same time from the moment of the placental connection until the moment of childbirth all its nourishment is derived from the mother the secret of the above paradoxical statement is made apparent when we understand the meaning of the scientific term osmosis osmosis is the passage of a fluid through a membrane it is a chemical process caused by the chemical affinity between two liquids or gases separated one from the other by a porous diaphragm or substance in the process of osmosis in the case before us the fetal blood takes up nourishing substances and oxygen from the blood of the mother and passes on to the other the waste products of the fetal system by means of passing these substances through the thin porous membrane which separates the two independent systems of blood vessels i e the system of the fetus and that of the mother before birth in fact the fetus has its blood nourished and oxygenated by means of the food partaken of by its mother and the oxygen taken in by the mother in her breathing after its birth the infant eats and breathes for itself and thus nourishes its blood supply directly instead of receiving it indirectly from the mother the placenta begins to be formed about the third month of gestation and continues to develop steadily from that time at the time of the delivery of the child the placenta covers nearly or quite one-third of the inner space of the distended uterus of the mother 
the total afterbirth consists of the placenta the umbilical cord and the remaining membranes of the ovum all of which are expelled after the birth of the child the amnion an important appendage contained in the uterus in connection with the developing fetus is that known as the amnion this is an inner sac which forms within the womb and which serves to enclose the fetus and also to sheath the umbilical cord the amnion encloses the embryo very snugly during the early stages of its development but it gradually becomes distended with a pale watery fluid known as the amnionic fluid the purpose of which is to float the fetus and to give it mechanical support on all sides this fluid is composed of water containing in solution small quantities of albumum urea and salt sex in the embryo and fetus it is impossible to determine the sex of the embryo during its early stages during the fourth week the first traces of the sexual glands appear but not until the fifth week can the sex be determined even by the microscope if the embryo is to become male certain ducts are transformed into convoluted tubules and each is attached to the testes which have formed from the genital nucleus if the embryo is to become a female the ducts join to form the uterus and vagina other portions being transported into the fallopian tube and connecting with the ovaries which have been formed otherwise the outer genitals appear in the early stages of the embryo but there is no apparent distinction between the sexes the external organs being the same in all cases and consisting of a small tubular organ with a small lateral fold of skin on either side later in the male a groove appears on the under side of this primitive organ thus forming the urethra the scrotum being formed from the folded skin at the side in the female the primitive organ ceases to develop as in the male and thus becomes proportionately smaller and evolves into the clitoris of the female the two lateral folds on each side being transformed into the labia majora or outer lips of the female external genitals position of the fetus during the period of gestation the fetus lies curled up in the bag of the omnion the head is usually relaxed and inclined forward the chin resting on the breast the feet are bent up in front of the legs the legs are bent up on the thighs the knees separated from each other but the heels almost touching on the back of the thighs the arms bent forward and the hands placed between them as though to receive the chin between them the folded up uterus forms an oval the longest diameter of which is about eleven inches at its greatest stage of growth nature here shows a wonderful ability to pack the fetus into as little space as possible and in such a position as to protect it from injury and to discommode the mother as little as possible the following interesting statement made by Helen Idelson, M.D., in a European medical journal several years ago, gives a very clear idea, expressed in popular terms, of the appearance and characteristics of the embryo or fetus in the various stages of its development. The growth of the embryo, after fecundation, is very rapid. On the tenth day, it has the appearance of a semi-transparent grayish flake. On the twelfth day, it is nearly the size of a pea filled with fluid in the middle of which is an opaque spot presenting the first appearance of an embryo which may be clearly seen as an oblong or curved body and is plainly visible to the naked eye on the fourteenth day the twenty-first day the embryo resembles an ant or a lettuce seed many of its parts now begin to show themselves especially the cartilaginous beginnings of the spinal column the heart etc the thirtieth day the embryo is as large as a horsefly and resembles a worm bent together there are as yet no limbs and the head is larger than the rest of the body when stretched out it is nearly half an inch long toward the fifth week the heart increases greatly in proportion to the remainder of the body and the rudimentary eyes are indicated by two black spots towards the sides the heart exhibits its external form bearing a close resemblance to that in an adult in the seventh week bone begins to form in the lower jaw and clavicle narrow streaks on each side of the vertebral column show the beginning of the ribs the heart is perfecting its form the brain enlarging and the eyes and ears growing more perfect and the limbs sprouting from the body the lungs are mere sacs and the trachea is a delicate thread but the liver is very large 
in the seventh week are formed the renal capsules and kidneys at two months the forearm and hand can be distinguished but not the arm the hand is larger than the forearm but it is not supplied with fingers the distinction of sex is yet difficult the eyes are prominent the nose forms an obtuse eminence the nostrils are rounded and separated the mouth is gaping and the epidermis can be distinguished from the true skin the embryo is from one half to two inches long the head forming more than one-third of the whole at the end of three months the eyelids are distinct but shut the lips are drawn together the forehead and nose are clearly traceable and the organs of generation prominent the heart beats with force the larger vessels carry red blood the fingers and toes are well defined and the muscles begin to be developed in the fourth month the embryo takes the name of fetus the body is six to eight inches in length the skin has a rosy color and the muscles produce a sensible motion the fetus born at this time may live several hours at five months the length of the body is from eight to ten inches at six months the length is twelve and one half inches the hair appears on the head the eyes closed the eyelids somewhat thicker and their margins as well as their eyebrows are studded with very delicate hairs at seven months every part has been increased in volume and perfection the bony system is nearly complete length twelve to fourteen inches if born at this period the fetus is able to breathe cry and nurse and may live if properly cared for at eight months the fetus seems to grow rather in length than in thickness it is only sixteen to eighteen inches long and yet weighs from four to five pounds the skin is very red and covered with down and a considerable quantity of sebaceous matter the lower jaw which at first was very short is now as long as the upper one finally at term nine months the fetus is about nineteen to twenty three inches long and weighs from six to eight pounds the red blood circulates in the capillaries and the skin performs the functions of perspiration the nails are fully developed another writer says there is a superstition that a child born at eight months is not as liable to live as if born at seven months indeed many suppose that an eight months child never survives facts do not prove this idea to be correct personally i have known several eight months babies to live and do well and i believe that their chance of life is much greater than if born at seven months children born in the seventh month of gestation are capable of living though great care is required to rear them for the first few months after birth the incubators now so common in large cities have greatly increased the chances of the seven months child and for that matter of those born even earlier there are a number of cases where children were born after six months of gestation and a few even before six months but these cases are rare and unusual and such children usually die soon after birth the following table given by a good authority shows the average length and weight of the human embryo and fetus age two weeks point one length in inches weight not given age three weeks point two length in inches weight three grains age four weeks point three length in inches weight not given age five weeks point five length in inches weight not given age six weeks point seven length in inches weight not given age seven weeks point nine length in inches weight not given age eight weeks one point five length in inches weight four drams age three months three point zero length in inches weight two ounces age four months six point zero length in inches weight five ounces age five months nine point zero length in inches weight ten ounces age six months twelve point zero length in inches weight one pound age seven months fifteen point zero length in inches weight three pounds age nine months seventeen point zero length in inches weight five pounds age nine months twenty point zero length in inches weight six to nine pounds 
Professor Clark holds that if at birth the infant weighs less than five pounds, it rarely thrives. The records show that many infants weighing much less than this have lived and thrived. In very rare cases, infants have been known to weigh no more than one pound at birth, and to have still survived and thrived. And, on the other hand, many cases are known where infants were born and thrived, who weighed more than twice the average weight. So, at the last, it is difficult to lay down hard and fast rules in the case. Delivery At the termination of the period of gestation, the child is born into the world, and instead of depending upon the blood of the mother for nourishment and oxygen, it begins to ingest its own food, to eliminate its own waste matter through the regular channels of the body, and to use its own lungs for the purpose of obtaining oxygen for its blood and to burn up the waste products in the lungs. The process of bringing a child into the world is called parturation. The fetus is expelled from the body of the mother by the contraction of the muscles of and around the uterus, and also by the contraction of the abdominal walls. In the early stages of labor, the uterine muscles are brought into play, but when the fetus enters into the vaginal passage, the abdominal muscles manifest their energy. The uterine and abdominal muscular movements are purely involuntary, although the mother may aid in the delivery by voluntary muscular movements. The involuntary muscular movements are due to the reflex action originating, probably, in a part of the spinal cord. The uterine contractions are rhythmical, and have been compared to the contraction of the muscles of the heart. Each labor pain begins with a minimum of contraction, the activity increasing until a maximum is reached, then it gradually decreases, only to be followed a little later by a new contraction. When the fetus is fully expelled from the uterus, followed later by the placenta or afterbirth, that organ begins a gradual contraction to its normal size, shape, and condition, the restoration process usually lasting over several weeks. The Physical Signs of Pregnancy The physical signs of pregnancy in the case of women of normal health are as follows. Number 1. Cessation of the menses or menstruation while it is true that a non-pregnant woman may occasionally pass over a menstrual period, yet as a general rule the complete cessation of a period by a married woman, particularly when the woman has previously been regular in this respect, may be considered a probable indication of pregnancy. And when the second period has been missed, the probability merges almost into a certainty. An examination by a competent physician will set all doubts at rest. Number 2 enlargement of the breasts. This indication usually manifests itself in about six or eight weeks after conception. The enlargement is usually preceded by a sensation of tingling and throbbing. The enlargement is manifested in the form of a rather hard and knotty increase, differing from the ordinary fatty increase. The lobules, arranged regularly around the nipple, are plainly distinguishable between the skin by means of the touch of the fingers. Number three darkening of the areola tissue surrounding the nipple. In the unpregnated condition, this tissue is of a pinkish shade, but after impregnation, the shade grows darker and the circle increases in size. However, when the woman bears several children in somewhat rapid succession, this dark color may become permanent and accordingly ceases to be an indication. Number 4. Enlargement of the Abdomen this indication manifests itself about the second month, at which time the uterus begins to elevate the intestines by rising up from the pelvis. In the fourth month, the uterus has risen so far out of the pelvis that it assumes the form and appearance of a hard, round tumor. The entire abdomen then begins to enlarge. The uterus causes an enlargement in the region of the navel at the sixth month and the region of the diaphragm at the ninth month. Number 5. Quickening or Signs of Life This indication manifests itself first from the fourth month to the fifth, at about the half of the entire period of gestation. At this time and afterward, the movements of the embryo are plainly discernible to the mother. The Disorders of Pregnancy There are a number of physical disorders usually accompanying pregnancy, some of which are trifling, but some of which require the advice of a competent physician. The best plan is for the woman to consult a physician shortly after she discovers herself to be pregnant, and thereafter to visit him occasionally for advice during the period of gestation. 
the too common plan of postponing the call upon the physician until the eighth or ninth month is not a wise one for in many cases the advice of a competent physician at an earlier stage of the pregnancy will obviate serious complications the call upon the physician should usually be made not later than the third or fourth month and positively not delayed longer than the fifth month the physician should make an examination to ascertain whether the child is in the normal position in the uterus and should also examine the urine each month to ascertain whether the kidneys are functioning normally what is called morning sickness is one of the most common of the disorders of pregnancy it is marked by nausea or vomiting or both early in the morning usually shortly after arising some women have at least faint symptoms of this disorder from the very beginning of conception but usually it does not manifest it till the third fourth or fifth week of pregnancy it usually ceases at the end of the third or fourth month except in very severe cases in which the physician should be consulted the disorder is not serious but requires but a little common sense treatment and rational habits of living an authority says eat of some fruit that best agrees with palate or stomach drink hot water eat nothing until a real hunger demands food where nausea occurs after eating a tart apple or orange is good another authority says let women suffering from morning sickness try acid fruit apples oranges or even lemons if their sourness is not unpleasant if a single orange or apple after each meal does not suffice let them try two let them eat ten if that number is necessary to conquer the distress the principle is a correct one and the relief certain let fruit be eaten at all hours of the day before meals and after on going to bed at night and at getting up in the morning if berries are in season let them be eaten in the natural state that is without sugar if the sickness still continues omit a meal now and then and substitute fruit in its stead by persistence in this course not only will nausea be conquered but an easy confinement guaranteed the pregnant woman often develops a capricious appetite this disorder may manifest in one or more of several forms as for instance the woman may lose her appetite and take but little food or she may develop an abnormally large appetite and eat much more than is necessary or she may take a dislike to certain kinds of foods many women have an aversion toward meat during pregnancy or she may have a craving for certain articles of food sometimes for kinds of foods not liked at other times such as sour pickles sour cabbage etc a little common sense and the presence of attractive articles of fruit etc will do much to relieve these troubles in extreme cases the physician's advice will help the pregnant woman should have her teeth put in good order as soon as possible as troubles with teeth sometimes manifest themselves during pregnancy and give much trouble and annoyance difficulty in urination constipation piles irritation or itching of the genital organs varicose veins liver spots and similar disorders which are sometimes manifest during pregnancy in some form or degree should receive the attention and care of a competent physician the following advice from a competent authority is worthy of being followed if everything is satisfactory if there is no severe vomiting kidney trouble etc the usual mixed diet may continue the only changes i would make are the following drink plenty of hot water during the entire time of pregnancy a glass or two in the morning two or three glasses in the afternoon the same at night from six to twelve glasses may be consumed also plenty of milk buttermilk and fermented milk plenty of fruit and vegetables meat only once a day for the tendency to constipation whole wheat bread rye bread bread baked of bran or bran with cream as to exercise either extreme must be avoided some women think that as soon as they become pregnant they must not move a muscle they are to be put in a glass case and kept there until the date of delivery other women on the other hand of the ultramodern type indulge in strenuous exercise and go out on long fatiguing walks up to the last day either extreme is injurious the right way is moderate exercise and short non-fatiguing walks bathing may be taken up to the day of the delivery 
but warm baths particularly during the last two or three months are preferable to cold baths childbirth the first indication of approaching delivery of the child is that of the descent of the child into the pelvis of the mother from its former position up near the diaphragm when this occurs the mother usually experiences a feeling of relief and a greater ease in breathing because of the relaxation of the former pressure on the diaphragm sometimes this occurs several days before delivery while in other cases it occurs only a few hours before delivery there usually occurs about the same time a slight discharge of mucus tinged with blood the latter is called the show and is caused by the unsealing of the mouth of the womb and indicates that the uterus is preparing to discharge its contents labor in childbirth consists of three stages in the first stage the uterus alone contracts and the mouth of the womb dilates in the second stage the abdominal muscles assist the uterus in expelling the child in the third state the placenta afterbirth and membranes are expelled after the delivery of the child and after the pulsation in the umbilical cord has ceased usually from ten to thirty minutes after delivery the umbilical cord is severed and tied by the physician in natural labor the expulsion of the afterbirth occurs from within a few minutes to an hour after the delivery of the child nature is sometimes slow in expelling the afterbirth but caution should be exercised in the matter of using force to assist nature in this matter for injury to the uterus has often resulted in malpractice in such a case the afterbirth is not firmly attached to the womb but is like the peel of an orange which nature sloughs off in time End of section 4. This was Audiobook Caboodle YouTube channel presentation. For full audiobook, check out our playlist section. Links in description below.